Today what I want to do is first lay out a brief historical sketch, kind of how, you know, how did I get into the government racket, um, what did I do while I was there, and kind of how did I get out. And, um, and then talk about what I thought would be kind of enlightening to discuss uh, part of the culture of the bureaucracy. Um, I assume I've never been in any other uh, agency, government agency, other than uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is a bureau within the Department of Labor. But I assume uh, and from that uh, the uh, my experiences are common to all, you know, all government agencies. Um, and I know, I guess, from from talking to a friend of mine who moved from the Bureau of Labor Statistics into the Department of Energy, that uh, yes, indeed. Uh, things are, you know, uh, bureaucracy is pretty much the same all over. Um, and anyway, my trek uh, started uh, somewhere in November or December of 1988. I was a senior at Northwestern College. I was an economics major. I was going to get a bachelor's in economics, and I didn't have any other major uh, discipline. So I was really kind of stuck uh, because there's not a lot, uh, there's not a lot of people really excited to hire uh, bachelors of economics. Um, I was thumbing through this magazine in the Career Development Center called Careers Magazine, put out by Business Week, I think. And I came across a full-page ad uh, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and they were advertising, looking for uh, anybody with a bachelor's degree in mathematics, statistics, or economics. And I thought, well, this is kind of a, a neat deal. I've never seen anybody asking for you know, a bachelor of economics degree. <laughs> and uh, I, wasn't, I, wasn't, uh, I didn't want to continue... My education right away. I wanted to get out and you know work in the real world, and um, the B the BLS the Bureau of Labor Statistics wasn't it, but that's where I ended up. Anyway, so I called the 800 number. It was a free call, and I knew I I, I had you know conservative uh, what should one say it, not intuition well intuition against even making the call, but I, I went ahead and made the call and um, gave them my number, and they said well, we'll send a packet of information uh, right away. And then all you have to do is you know read through it, fill out the the proper form, sent back in. Well, um, true enough, I didn't hear to that hear from them for the next couple of months. And I called them back in January, and uh, lo and behold, uh, they had lost my name, my address. So, <laughs> so this should have been a clue, you know, kind of to to to, to uh, what 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 I'd experienced uh, firsthand uh, later on. But in January of '89, again, I called again. I received the stuff right on time. And uh, it's, I, I forgot to bring it. I meant, I still have a copy of it because it was, they make you fill out like a 10 year uh, biography, the last 10 years of your life. And literally, if, you, if there's like a month that you don't have accounted for, then you're going to get called up by their personnel people and say, well, what were you doing during this month of time? Month of time? You'll make sure you weren't doing something subversive, like, you know, speaking at the Mises Brown Bag <laughs> Seminar. <laughs> um, anyway, so I, I filled it out, and it's like 10 pages long, and you, you send that to the Bureau, and in uh, and I may have finally got it completed by April, so in a three-month three span, I completed it. Sent it in, and by mid-May, I received a notice that I uh, was placed on their register, and I had a ranking of 89. And that's all they told me. They didn't say, well, what was, what's the scale? Is it 89 out of 1,000 or 89 out of, you know, out of 90 or anything? Well, anyway, the last week in May, I received a notice saying, well, we have openings. Call us up for an interview if you're interested. Well, I was still kind of enamored with this idea of, well, maybe getting to Washington for a year or two and working. And um, so I, I gave them a call, and I had you know, nothing else on the docket as far as employment. I was you know, completely clueless. So I gave them a call. Uh, and I flew out uh, in June of 1989 uh, for two days of interviews. And the BLS is very much a shotgun approach. I, in two days, I spoke to 20 different managers. So I had basically like 20 different half-hour-long interviews, um, which at first really frightened me. But then I realized that, that they had already seen everything, all of my paperwork, and kind of, I guess, figured out I was okay and they were pretty much selling their offices to me. They'd say, you need, you need to come to work for OSHA. Because, you, know, you need to come to work for us because we're doing OSHA statistics, and that's really important. Or you need to come to, come to work for us because you know, we're doing benefit analysis, and benefits are the hot thing, going to be, you know, gonna be the, the big thing in the next few years. And that, so everyone's like trying to say, well, come to work for our office. Okay. Um, anyway, the, and they actually kind of have a, a pretty decent way of, of hooking you up. Um, they... After all interviews are done with, I, they have you go back to the personnel office and they say, well, what, what were your five favorite offices that you'd like to work with? So you have to come up with your list of five, one to five, 
and you give that to the personnel office. And then they, you know, uh, call back to everybody that I met with and try to match me up best, you know, if, if any of those five are interested in me, then they try to, you know, give me my highest preference. Well, it worked out that I got my first preference. So that that was uh, my first, uh, I should say, ex-ante preference in terms of what office I wanted to work in. Um, and so that, that, was, that was great. Um, you know, I was excited. And, uh, you know, I got home, uh, like, on a Friday. or I'm Sorry, no, I got home on a Sunday, flew back to Iowa on a Sunday. And the following day, uh, the BLS called me up and offered me a job. And uh, so I said, sure. And they also have this, like, well, you can kind of come whenever you want, basically, type of deal. And so I said, well, how about the end of August? So I figured I'm going to work for the rest of my life. I thought, and uh, uh, I'll have two months then to kind of, you know, tie up some loose ends and, and, and hang out at home and stuff. And, and so I showed up uh, to work at the uh, General Accounting Office in Washington, D.C. on Monday, August 28, 1989. And um, basically what my job was, they called me an economist, but I wasn't, re I wasn't really an economist. I was a trainer. Okay, and I think they called me an economist because they had a, you know an economist uh, budget slot on their in their budget. They didn't have a slot for a trainer; they had a slot for an economist. So they called me an economist, and they just put me to work training people. And um, I trained what they called field economists, which are actually data collectors, to collect data and to collect the area wage survey. Okay, and I went to work for this this woman right here. Uh, <laughs> this is. This is uh, this is Laura B. King, the associate commissioner in the Office of Field of Operations, and um, I just show this to show that my title is completely overdrawn. You know, the Living Dead just kind of is is, is rather appropriate here. Anyway, that she was my boss, and this is what I this is what I collected. This is the uh, the forms I used to collect the area wage survey. Okay, and basically the area wage survey is um, is an annual survey of wages and benefits. Okay. Uh, information uh, from a sample of different firms uh, that have more than 50 employees, okay, um, in a particular metropolitan area, okay. So you go to different cities like New York has an AWS, Omaha even has an AWS, uh, P Birmingham I'm sure probably has an AWS survey. It's area wage survey, okay. And um, these are, like I said, these are basically the forms and. and First of all, you have to uh, find out what kind of benefit information are they, what kind of uh, health care package are they offering. And I, I, got the under, I got the impression everyone was really heavily scared of the Drug Enforcement so, uh, Administration. Uh, whenever I went and asked about health care benefits, they were really, really proud of their uh, drug and uh, alcohol abuse treatment programs. And you know, I, this one lady told me that four times. I didn't even ask her. And she's telling me, well, we've got, you know, a great uh, drug and alcohol abuse treatment program. I said, well, that's good for you. I'm only going to mark it down here once. But, um, and then basically, this is how, this is how the, uh, the data shows up on the forms, is they have just different job titles that, uh, that you, you match a particular job with, and then you, you know, find out are they male, female, how many workers do you have, how many hours per, uh, hours per day, and what's their salary rate per week or per month and, or what have you. And then it all gets broken down. Into, when they publish the data, it's all you know, broken down properly. Um, let's see. And so, so my job was to train introductory people in, in collecting this stuff. Okay. And uh, my, big, my big claim to fame during my two-year uh, term there was I, I was placed in charge of the, the head, or not the head, the biggest course, it was a seven-day course, intro course that we offered, and uh, I uh, also produced the initial phone interview training workshop that the Bureau has ever done, because they were getting into telephone collect data collection, so my, so my, 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 my big, you know, my, my big pinnacle of, of activity was this interview training two-day workshop that I, uh, that I was able to put together, because I happened to have a part-time job as a, a telemarketer for a summer in Omaha, okay, um, I also set up and help manage conferences. So whenever we'd have, we'd have big uh, nationwide conferences for all the field economists, uh, say, that were conducting the white collar pay survey, which is kind of like this, but for more uh, professional technical jobs. Um, I w they'd have these people come together in a big place like Denver or uh, San Antonio or someplace like that. And so I would help get these conferences together, which basically meant talking to a lot of people on 
from hotels. Now, now, Sean, did you ever serve as one of these field officers, or did you just start right at the top? Well, <laughs> funny you should mention that. Um, I also collected data on occasion, which is good if you're going to train somebody to, to collect data. You'd think that you had some some ex- expertise in that. Well, what they the first they sent me for a week long trip uh, to Philadelphia it was it was a first time training trip. I went out and just observed uh, somebody uh, collecting data, and um, stayed is pretty neat deal, stayed in you know, Philadelphia for a week, it's paid for by the taxpayers, and just watched somebody collect data from different companies. As also, the, the thing I like most about that trip is also, that was the place I bought uh, a copy of the Ultimate Foundation of Economic Science. And that was three, three or four weeks into my stint at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And if you know anything about what Mises says about statistics and how valuable they are to ec- economics, um, that kind of, kind of set the course for my, the rest of my two years and how how I felt about my job, okay? Um, anyway, uh, and then on, on subsequent equations, I spent five weeks by myself in Providence, Rhode Island collecting data, and three weeks in San Francisco at different times. And then the rest of the time was all spent, uh, the bulk of it in Washington, just doing these, these courses and conferences and stuff like that. Um, after two years, I decided to get out. Um, my original plan was to spend, you know, take a year and go to Washington and uh, spend time just uh, take a year and then go on to grad school, save some money. But I soon realized at the entry level salary, even though it's it's you know, fairly high for a bachelor's for BA in, in economics, you cannot save any money your first year in Washington. I found so I had to wait till my second year. In my second year, I got involved with uh, the uh, woman who would later become my wife. So when we decided to get married, um, I decided to leave the government and go to Omaha and see if we could have things work out between us in Omaha and they did and I got married later but anyway so after two years I said enough is enough I I got I I, I became fed up with my experience basically and and uh, I said was enough was enough and I I I didn't uh, I I, I definitely knew after two years I didn't want to do this for the rest of my life Mm -hmm. and uh, basically uh, it boiled down to what I what I called life was with statistics Um, I didn't feel, in my position, I was doing anything terribly important, okay? Um, as I said, in my first trip to Philadelphia, I bought the Ultimate Foundation of Economic Science, and uh, I noticed on, on a couple, I, I looked, I thumbed through it even last night, a couple sentences about how, you know, statistics are basically just economic history of the recent past, and um, I really, that really stuck to me, that, and, and as I read through, kept trying to make my way through human action, uh, it became more and more apparent that uh, what we're doing is of no great, uh, of no, what should one say? The value to what I was doing was just not, not enough to make me want to stay there, okay? Um, there's not a huge demand for BLS material uh, by those that say they're going to use it, okay? The people that, that want to use it that ostensibly is Congress, okay? Um, but but what does Congress want to use it for? They want to use it so that they can devise better programs, they can devise better laws, they can better regulate our, our activity, okay? Mm-hmm. So that, to me, was not a, a really valid uh, excuse for staying in, in, in the, the BLS biz, okay? Um, and also, I mean, they, they have what they call a Service Contract Act, which means that if anybody has a, a, a contract with the federal government, that they've got to be paying the, the prevailing wage rate, okay? So that uh, if uh, if somebody has a contract with some federal government, that you've got to pay your secretaries as much as everybody else pays their secretaries. Is all basically what it ran, run, runs down to. Well, they also uh, have they, they started putting like McDonald's and Burger Kings on military bases uh, through some type of contract program. Well, when this happened, well, what did that mean? We needed to do. We need to find data for fast food program or fast food uh, facilities to make sure that these. These, these McDonald's that are on uh, uh, Air Force bases are paying the prevailing wage rate. Now, we were all, we, we talked, I talked to these field economists that go out and collect this data, and they come out, well, what's, you know, what, what does an average cooker get? Oh, about minimum wage. And you think, you're kidding. The minimum wage, and that's, what, that's the prevailing wage rate, would be three thirty-five an hour, you know? And it just, it, uh, to me, it seems like we're, we're you know, flushing thousands of dollars Hundred thousand dollars down the drain to find out that the prevailing wage rate for a uh, you know an introductory fry person in McDonald's is three thirty five an hour. You know who to thunk it? You know. Okay. Right. 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 Okay. 
So I just didn't think at that point that that if it, uh, what you, you put up with in the bureaucracy, you know, the, the, say the, the the marginal cost, if you will, staying there and working there, did not or was far outweighed any marginal benefit that the end product is this data uh, would uh, show for it. Okay, um, and uh, so, so that's basically life of statistics. Okay, um, another thing I want to touch on. One of the things that 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 that, that drove for me, it kind of kind of builds up over the course of two years uh, reasons why I, I didn't like it or I didn't care for the bureau was I guess in the broad sense people would call just bureaucratic waste. Okay, and when I would come back and visit everybody at home, I'd say, look, I said everything you've heard about big government is true, and it's even worse than you've heard. Basically, that's that's what I would tell them, and it's true. Um, <clears throat> Mises, I also, while I was there, uh, bought the book Bureaucracy uh, by Mises and, and read through it. On page 47, he has the, uh, the, uh, the statement, in public administration, there is no connection between revenue and expenditure. And he is not kidding. <laughs> um, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and bureaucracy in general is not a profit-seeking enterprise. Um, as we define profits, okay, there, there are, you know, there, there are... In, in, in their sense, I guess the closest thing to profits they have would be larger budgets, okay, that they can spend more money. But they don't, they don't, uh, they don't have, but they don't have, a, they don't seek profits as we define profits, okay. If for them, their mentality is if the money's in the budget, we spend it, okay. Um, and a perfect example of this is is the travel voucher waste when people go like me would go on these, uh, you know, government trips funded by you and. Um, like I, the week I spent in Philadelphia, or the five weeks I spent in Providence, or the, the week conference you go to in Kansas City. Okay, you, the, the the way they do this is you have to fill out a travel voucher every time you you travel somewhere. You got you're allotted a certain amount of money per day for hotel expenses, depending on the city where you live, and you're also allowed a certain amount of money for food per day. Well, I the first trip I took to Philadelphia, I was like keeping all my receipts at every restaurant I went to. Because I was going to like, you know, fill out how much money did I uh, have in the, how much money did it, did I uh, get charged to my uh, to my account, and so I can get reimbursed for just the exact amount. Well, I turn it, turn all this stuff in, and my supervisor comes back and says, "Well, this is this is nice, but we really don't do it this way." He said, "What was the per diem food uh, amount for Philadelphia? It's thirty-four dollars a day." Well, he said, "Well, just fill out thirty-four dollars, you know, line, line it all the way through, and then whatever you don't spend, you just pocket it." And, and that's honestly the way that you're instructed to do things because to them is too big a hassle to kind of check all your little vouchers. And so that there's no, there wasn't any effort to really conserve on, on the part of how much money you spend per day in food. I mean, it's, it, it, it's depend, relative to the size of government, it's a pretty I mean, small expenditure. But did they, did they have a, a, a survey team that went out and checked the, the prices of hotels and stuff at the... <laughs> yeah. I, I think they do that kind of more a casual survey, but I mean, I'm sure that they, you know, people call all the time and they get like these resort books and you find out, well, what's the, because everyone, they get, they, they'll give you a government rate for a hotel, which is less than, less than like we would normally live. It's $199 for a normal person. You maybe get it for 140 or something. And the government would allow that. But, um, I don't, I don't, I don't know how, I don't know how they figured that out. They were, there's, Stuff even beyond the BLS to, 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 to figure those the per diem rates out. Do um, you think it was transaction costs that motivated that? Or actually yeah. The eyes got in the fees cost, or do I think Gorsuch would have brought the politics of bureaucracy just as a nice way to avoid eleventh hour budget spending? Just make sure you're always spending so you never get that back. Oh sure, sure. And I think I do think that was the ex that was what I was told that look it'd be nice if. You'd only have to, we'd only re reimburse you the exact amount that you spent, but it'd be it'd take the ladies down at the down at Treasury too too much to work through all this. You know, the ladies down at budget would get you know too fouled up and it'd take too much time. So we'll just give you the whole, yeah, we'll just give you the whole amount. Of, we'll just give you the whole ball of wax. Um, another way that they constantly spent money is how they try to justify where they went for conferences. Okay, now if <coughs> if we were concerned with minimizing costs. Uh, we would the BLS would have every national the government would have every national conference in Kansas City, Missouri, if if they were concerned because they had one of the lowest government hotel rates of major cities. 
Plus, they have a regional office in Kansas City, so the Kansas City people never wouldn't have to fly anywhere. Plus, it's in a centralized location. Plus, the uh, the per diem level for food was the lowest in the country. Okay, but we in all, in two years we met there. Well, we never met there for a national conference because they want to be able to send. Every, every office wants to be able to send some people away, kind of like a vacation type deal. So you end up going to Denver, or you end up going to San Antonio, or to Washington D.C. Okay, and, and the way the way you justify these, any any city you want to, you, you had to kind of fill out a, a justification form and say, look, we've looked at three different cities, and the city we want to pick is the cheapest of what we looked at that's feasible. All I have to do is like pick any city you want to go to. And then tack on New York and Los Angeles, and automatically, hey, we're the cheapest, you know. And that was we did that I mean, routinely. We would do that, and that, that's how you pick what what city you wanted. And also, basically, it was uh, I don't know, if, yeah, wherever wherever she wanted to go was where we ended up going. And that's the, that's that was the bottom line. Okay. So Cleveland never made the list. That's right, and never once did we go to go to Cleveland. Um, so so it it. it, it Prevented waste in that in, 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 in those in those types of manners. Plus, it also uh, just promoted inefficiency. The way employees, uh, you know, employees, there's no way to there's no way to calculate the marginal you know the marginal benefit that you're that you're giving to a bureaucratic institution. There's no way to calculate the marginal benefit that a field economist is providing to uh, the BLS when they don't have to worry about making a profit. They can you know, they sell their survey booklets for like a buck fifty. It's, it, it, which I mean, obviously, is not taking any. Not well. I'm going to say it's more than it's worth. But anyway, you know, it, it does. It doesn't even. You know, the cost of producing that that little booklet is, is I would say, is probably much greater than a dollar fifty. You know, considering everything involved that goes into it. Um. So instead, you know, so so what you get is 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 government employees through their union lobbying Congress for things like flex time, so that you can kind of come in when you want to. Um, you get salary position with 13 days of sick leave a year. So thir on top of 13 days of holiday leave per year, you get 13 days of sick leave, which soon became holiday leave at, in term in practical terms. And you have these you have supervisors telling you, "I'm going to take a mental health day tomorrow." <laughs> uh, it's this like, in Iowa we don't have mental health days you know I don't I don't understand that but then maybe in Washington you might need them I yeah, guess you might need them. Um, the tenure system itself promotes slack as well that um, you have a one day when you get hired by the government you have a one day or one day one year probationary period which they allege that they can fire you for nothing or for, for basically any infraction and then once you get on uh, after a year you have like a tenure system where they really uh, They've got to, you know, go through paperwork and go through hearings, et cetera, et cetera, to get you relieved of your of your job. Um, and this this makes a big deal. We, they had they hired. This, I mean, this is important. They ha they hired Pam from Atlanta, who was a manic depressive. We didn't. I didn't find out about this until like a year later, um, after she had uh, made my life a little uncomfortable. She was in my first intro class I taught by myself, okay, and she was a heavy-duty partier, and I didn't realize this because it was part of it was because she had these, these, these mental problem. And she was on she's on drugs, she's on lithium, not drugs, lithium, but also liked to drink a lot. And the doctor said, look, you've either got to give up alcohol or give up your medicine. Well, she gave up her medicine. And so, <laughs> so I had this manic depressive in class, and it, like she would party at 5.30 in the morning, and she calls everybody up in the class at 5.30, including me. And she had to call the Arlington uh, information to get my number to call me up. So she had to work to call me up at 5.30 and say, hey, this is your 5.30 wake-up call. And so I chastised her the next day and told her, well, this isn't funny at all. You know, I'm, and then she, in her evaluation, says, you know, I allow too much horseplay in class. But, I, but how, how does this work? Well, you know, I sent her off on her way down to the Atlanta regional office, and she was going out collecting data. And she got into trouble right away by demanding that she be able to use pink uh, business cards. Everybody else in the bureau had to use was, was standard policies, white with dark, you know, blue or black writing. She wanted pink, you know, pink with mauve writing or something. And um, then one time she's out on a visitation with this, with this one visitation with uh, uh, one of the senior people. She walked right in and she goes, everybody freeze, we're from the IRS, this is a raid. 
and the BLS is a purely voluntary. The AWS is a completely voluntary uh, survey, and if the gov- if they don't want you, they can just boot you out. Now, sometimes these you know the firms don't know that, but in, but if the firm said get out, they'd have to leave. But so th- this this lady kind of freaked everybody out, screaming, "No, this the IRS is a raid!" And so so. Uh, uh, the guy, I can't remember, the, the associate commissioner in uh, in the Atlanta regional office is looking for ways to, to, to fire this girl. Well, lo and behold, they caught her cheating uh, fairly substantially on one of her on one of her uh, travel vouchers, and so that gave them an excuse, as if they didn't. I mean, as if they didn't already have one, they gave an excuse to, to, to give her the heave ho. And my point is that that if if she would all she, if she would have stuck it out for a year, then the bureau would have pretty much been stuck with that woman because of the tenure system, and it would have been a lot harder. For uh, the bureau to get rid of, to get rid of this person. Um, a case in point was uh, 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 Sandy King, who was. Uh, I mean, I don't. Nobody I hope knows Sandy King. Uh, I'm, I should probably shouldn't mention her name. Uh, but no, this is no, this is this is completely under well, not completely unrelated to Laura King. But but uh, she was having, I guess, ended up in a, in some type of heavy duty uh, adulterous affair, and the stuff was getting into the office and causing severe problems between uh, the job getting jobs getting done okay and when it became apparent to their supervisors that look we've got a problem something's got to be done we've got to split these people up so instead of disciplining uh, either one of them uh, Sandy King or the guy I can't remember the guy's name who was involved um, he worked in the BLS also yes yeah yeah and um, yeah he was in the same office and they, he was like a GS 15 she was a GS 14. So some fairly big people within the, in, in the BLS, and instead of disciplining either one of them, uh, Laura King thought Laura King thought the best thing to do was, let, hey, let's create a GS15 spot in prices, and we'll move her from a GS14 promoter to a GS15, <laughs> and we'll get them in different buildings. And so, you know, the point is, if you want to get promoted in the BLS, uh, you know, have an affair. <laughs> okay. Um, there was a lot of turf protecting also going on. This this this, this lack of say profit uh, control, uh, not having to to meet the, the profit taskmaster, allowed for a lot of slack and a lot of a lot of turf protecting. The only the only people that I saw in the BLS that, that seemed quote unquote fulfilled in their job uh, were people of like like Laura King or the GS15s or GS14s that have carved out little empires within the bureaucracy for themselves and had their own turf that they protected with vengeance and also constantly trying to encroach on other programs turf so that there's constantly a war between the program office who designed and uh, evaluated and published the survey and the office of field of operations which is what I was in which was the liaison office between the regional offices and the national office in Washington. So there's, there's this constant fighting. Whenever we have training conferences, you know, you get somebody from the program office say, hey, look, you guys, you guys in o- OFO don't know anything about, the, you guys are you know, technically inept. We don't know anything about the surveys, which is basically true. And we didn't know nearly as much about the technical, you know, what's a secretary for versus a secretary three. Um, we didn't know anything. We knew something. We didn't know as much as the program office. But on the other hand, you know, the OFO would say, "Well, look, you guys in program office, sure, you know the survey, but you don't know how to to communicate. You don't know how to train these people. Uh, you know, worth anything. I mean, your idea of training is to, to say all this, to put up the, uh, the 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 job description up on on a transparency. Say this is a secretary four. A secretary four, you know, is, is similar to an office manager, and and they just read you know read the job description." So there's, there's this constant fighting and bickering because with turf, of course, comes budget, okay? it comes, comes money and uh, more perks for themselves. And uh, you know, Al Pettengill, who was my direct supervisor, he was the best, the best technician that the OFO had. And what they did when they reorganized, they made him a training specialist. He didn't know training at all. The best person that they, that they had that was a trainer, who had been a trainer for oh, 20 years, um, he was originally with like secretarial staff for Nixon, I guess, um, and went to the BLS. So she was she was the best trainer we had, and she basically, in a sense, I reported to her kind of unofficially. And she was my supervisor. She trained me, and she was she was the best trainer they had. But she was out of the political loop. She was invaluable to Laura King politically uh, in this turf battle. So she got stuck at a GS12. They promoted uh, Pettengill to a GS13, 
and uh, because he could go to these other meetings, these inter-office meetings, and spy on all these people and come back and tell Laura King, well, this is what the program office is planning to do for the next conference. And it's just really, really crazy. Um, and when I come back, when I, when I would come back to uh, the Midwest to visit my friends or go visit you know, my sister up in college, and I talked to my old professors. And I, there's one philosophy professor who's <coughs> politically as liberal as the day is long. And I was talking to him and his wife, and uh, you sh and I, I was going on and you know ranting and raving about how the the bureaucracy is bad, as everybody says. And she goes, "Yeah, but you know there are a lot of good people." That are in the that are in the bureaucracy. You know, there's a lot of good people in bureaucracy too. You know, I said, well, yeah, I know, but that's not the point. I mean, I I work with people that I thought were great people, but they when you don't have to make a profit, there's 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 just no incentive to perform to the level that you have to perform in the private sector. So that they are people that uh, that you that you soon soon learn uh, you don't have to perform, uh, and you can you can. Uh, just be slack. You can uh, assume waste, and it, it doesn't matter because, as, as Harriet, this, this lady who was my supervisor, said on numerous occasions, she says she get fed up and say, you know, they're wasting money here. She was she was 62 years old, and so she had uh, she was a very wise woman, and um, she had started out as a secretary, so she knew what it was like to to scrimp and have to save. And she said these people just waste money like you wouldn't believe. But it doesn't matter because we don't have to make a profit. She goes, that's why we do. We don't have to make a profit. So I mean, she knew I mean, the basic economic principle involved in in bureaucracy. And um, let's see. Right. Um, well, that was just okay. Um, anyway, I, I tried. My, my point was that it doesn't matter if they're good people or not. The people that are good will get stuck and get and get trapped by some fairly good financial and healthcare perks. And they get, they get trapped in, in a job they just don't care for. Um, another section of bureaucracy I thought is pertinent is that, that Mises point out was called the bureaucrat as voter. And he point, Mises points out that the bureaucrat is not only the employer, but in some sense he's also, or the employee, he's also in some sense the employer in the sense that he's voting um, and he's making contributions to this, this, this democratic process that's going to, uh, you know, it's going to decide how much bureaucracy we, we have in some sense, okay? And um, he says that the bureaucrat as voter is more eager to get a raise than to keep the budget balanced. His main concern is to swell the payroll. And um, I, I completely agree with that. When I was, uh, I was in the Bureau of Labor Statistics during the 1990 fabled Bush budget deal, you know, the, the no new taxes uh, pledge breaking ceremony that they had. And... Um, during that whole time, the BLS employees, of course, was concerned only, and this is true, only with, as, as far as I could tell, with keeping as much money as possible in their budget. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter to them if the budget's balanced or not. You know, they weren't even that concerned about sequestering because they know in the past, every time the possibility of shutting down the government came up, we just lift that debt cap and it's no problem. We'll just keep, we'll negotiate for another, another week. And then if we haven't figured out a budget, well, we'll just lift that debt cap again. And we'll negotiate for another week, and by the third week of October, it'll all be ironed out. Okay. Um, BLS on the BLS employees were were uh, some of them uh, were, were proud of the fact that they were on t local television, uh, you know, uh, demonstrating outside uh, the, the facilities where the Bush people and the Congress people had their summit meeting before this budget deal. They were, you know, they were they were uh, petitioning them, you know, petitioning uh, the the summit as federal employees to, you know. Uh, give us, give us our budget. You know, give us our money. And the only time frugality was emphasized was in the Octo was in October of 1990 when there was some concern that we weren't going to get money. We had no idea once this this year this budget for ni for fiscal year 91 was passed. We had no idea how much money would be shifted retroactively to October, and so that and so they they really were unsure how much money they, there would be in the till for the month of October, and that was the only time. That there was any concern for uh, frugality of any sort, you know, like you know, transport, uh, uh, government trips came to a halt, uh, the scheduled conferences in October came to a halt, and the only reason that did that that happened is because they were afraid that they weren't going to get the money. Um, and so, from my from my point of view, the only way to solve the deficit is to slash spending drastically and just 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 cut their budgets, just cut their budgets. Because if you say we're going to solve 
solve the problem by increasing taxes. We all know we're just going to spend the money that comes in. And you're just going to say, hey, we got new money. That means bigger budgets. The more, the bigger the budget, we're, I mean, if we get a bigger budget, we're just going to spend that much more money. Okay? So the only time, the only way to solve a deficit problem is, is to slash budgets drastically. Um, let's see. Um, also, I, I should point out, I guess, yeah, the, the Pay Reform Act of 1990, which was, I think, actually a pretty revolutionary, a pretty, well, I don't know rev revolutionary, but a very expensive act in the midst of all this budget cutting mania, the budget balancing mania, Bush signed into law the pay, Federal Pay Reform Act of 1990, which basically uh, was, was, was uh, proposed and passed on the foundation that, look, these poor federal employees are not getting paid enough money. That if they're in the private sector, I always heard this a lot, if I was in the private sector, I'd be making a lot more money than I am now. But because I'm a federal servant, I'm just, I'm just, not, I'm just not able to, to make as much money as I could be. And I'm thinking to myself, I've got a bachelor's in economics. Where could I get, make $30,000 a year as, with a bachelor's in economics? And the, and the answer is z nowhere, unless I was in business selling something, you know, for myself, selling something of value. And uh, the BLS data was not it, okay? Um, but but in, in the midst of this mania, they wanted to guarantee, you know, they, 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 uh, they, they passed this Federal Pay Reform Act, which guaranteed pri you know, wage hikes like by a percentage following the CPI and any wage differentials that occurred uh, throughout, throughout the country. If, if there was a, a giant wage differential between, say, uh, what private sector Chicago employees are making versus uh, uh, government employees, then uh, they, were, you know, they would try to fix that by, by jockeying the wages up. Of course, everybody at the BLS were, were happy about that because first, <laughs> you know, that's, that's automatic pay increases for us. Plus, where are they going to get the data to show these differentials? BLS, okay? <laughs> so it's, 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 it's more this, this turf building thing. Um, the final thing I want to leave you with is, is the, the observation that I found after two years that the, the bureaucracy really kills the human spirit <laughs> if, I, if, if, if you immerse yourself in it. Uh, one soon learns that... Uh, that uh, your task as a bureaucrat is to follow rules. It's not to do uh, a job particularly well. Um, the, the, the common phrase, the most, most often uttered phrase by uh, junior level uh, bureaucrat employees is good enough for government work. That, uh, you know, th this may not be great, but it's good enough for the government. The government doesn't have to make a profit. Um, and the, the reason that it kills the human spirit is that there's no incentive. There's no reward for effort or success in the bureau. Um, at least no direct, you know, no reward directly tied to the amount of effort and the success that you have in your efforts putting these things out. Um, I mean, you can't really add to the value of the product, so there's no reason for for you to work hard in in your job. Your, a performance uh, it, success is not uh, success in your job or in your task or how well you do your job is not going to get you promoted. It has to do is are you in Laura King's political loop? Are you valuable some way? to her in, 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 in uh, her getting more turf and protecting her turf. Um, there's no incentive to better oneself. Uh, they, they, they try to get you to go to these different you know, training conferences and computer skills or writing or et cetera, et cetera. But you certainly learn that in, in the BLS, knowledge isn't power, knowledge is work. That if you get sent to these things, sure, you're going to know more. What does that mean? We're just going to pile more stuff on you and we're not going to compensate you in any, in, in any real fashion. Okay, so it's, so it, it just goes against the, it goes against the work ethic, and you, you people start to develop an attitude of how do I shirk, mm -hmm. and I found that in myself, and I, I don't even know if I'm I'm not really completely over part of part of the mentality <laughs> that I that I uh, start to develop there. You know, people will get trapped. People will hate their jobs, and you can see it in their face. Um, uh, Bruce Edwards, a friend of mine, would, would come in, and he he he'd hate his job. He was put in the wrong job for him. Um, he didn't want to come in in the morning, but it was too costly for him to leave. He, he had roots there. He had a family. He had kids. He had sunk. He had was making you know forty thousand dollars a year, and he couldn't find it in the private sector, so he was stuck. Um, and uh, to close, I want to end with a rather rather sad uh, paragraph that I actually emailed to different to my friends at the BLS, and I got completely positive responses from this that say yes, this is what should be sent to the you know the commissioner. It's out of bureaucracy on page 94, and it's in a chapter called The Psychological Consequences of Bureaucratization. And it says, uh, it is quite a different thing under the rising tide of bureaucratization. Government jobs offer no opportunity 
For the display of personal talents and gifts, regimentation spells the doom of initiative. The young man has no illusions about his future. He knows what is in store for him. He will get a job with one of the innumerable bureaus. He will be but a cog in a huge machine of the working of which is more or less mechanical. The routine of a bureaucratic technique will cripple his mind and tie his hands. He will enjoy security, but this security will be rather of the kind that the convict enjoys within the prison walls. He will never be free to make decisions or to shape his own fate. He will forever be a man taken care of by other people. He will never be a real man relying on his own strength. He shudders at the sight of the huge office buildings in which he will bury himself. Mm. And, and that, to me, was, is, a perf- is a perfect one-paragraph picture of what I found in the BLS, right down to the huge cement drab government building that I had to walk in every day. And so at the end of the two years, I decided to kind of you know, leave that society and, and, and just you know, go back home, basically. And I left and have been much, much happier ever since. You demonstrated how... How bad government is by you know by demonstrating that you leave there and, and become a graduate. Student. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you. I remember when Sean first showed up, he was so happy, he had a smile on his face, and it was really, really quite something. I knew that he either didn't have any idea of what it was like to be a graduate student, or had been you know coming from someplace uh, just terrible. Well, there, there again, we're dealing with the ex ante, ex post utility uh, uh, problem. We got to evaluate. Uh, uh, real quick, way that. Everything that Sean said, I mean, he experienced it on a much grander scale. But when I was uh, in college, I had an internship with the BLS for about four months. And it was my job to process those surveys that Sean was showing us. <laughs> and uh, they they spent about a week or so, if that, training me on doing this stuff. And they had women um, there that were secretaries who used to just take stacks of them. And on the back there is a, when they get the form, you know, they, they account, as Sean said, for um, how many employees they have, their weight, their salaries, and everything else. And if there was any change from month to month, there was a uh, mark, a place on the back to account for what the difference was. Growth, seasonal, um, you know, they let the people go for, uh, you know, whatever reason. And if there was nothing marked, it was always just check. Growth. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, people didn't even, people sometimes wouldn't even check the back of the form to see if anything was marked. You just pushed it through that the company had grown. And I mean, I learned very quickly not to not to question. If I gave, if they gave me a task and I could do it in an hour or so, I'd come back and give it to them, and they'd be like, well, "We didn't have anything else for you to do today. This was supposed to occupy me for the whole day." Yeah. And um, it's it's true what Sean said, and very quickly it, it dampened your spirits. It only took me. I don't know if Sean's braver than I am, or just uh, more desperate at the time. I was still in school, and it only took me four months to really figure that out. But um, <laughs> I just uh, got an email uh, today uh, from one of our recent graduates um, at Auburn in the economics program who now has a job at the FCC, Communications Commission. Uh, He's in something called the Bureau of Competition. And they hired him as an economist uh, because they needed an economist. They have like 200 lawyers and, and him. And that's the Bureau... Bureau of Competition. I can't remember everything he said in the. He's only been there four months, and he, I can't remember everything he said in the email, and most of which I couldn't repeat, even if I could. But I, I do recall that he said uh, twice. He said uh, or wrote rat infested. So uh, I don't think he's getting along too well there in government, uh, government either. But uh, yeah. older than the Department of Labor. And they were here in the early in that line early, but in the 1800s. So they they would say, well, you know, the BLS is here before the Department of Labor. The BLS will be here longer than that because Congress can't get along without its data, basically. And but they would there wasn't really there wasn't really much much uh, say competition in that way between the different offices. Something about uh, BLS data. <clears throat> A lot of good examples are really garbage in, garbage out. I, should, I work for BLS too, but I wonder how many people are going to But one, one problem that was then got with Tom I was there with the verbal study is they're having trouble uh, keeping tabs on the people checking prices. You know, the BLS comes up with a PCI, which is for price index once a month. And at the time, most of the people that were actually supposed to be going into the stores and checking each month on the price of literally thousands of goods was the army of part-time workers and college students and so on. And uh, there were 
problems in checking that they've done what they said they did. But a lot of drive acting when people are just uh, so inflationary period that they bump up the prices a little bit. And, and they even had uh, double checkers. So, so we have accounts where, uh, you know, in the, the, the second week in August, somebody's been in this five and nine store and check the prices on pantyhose and all these things and so on. And then the third week in August, the double checker had been in and just asked the manager had the price checker mm -hmm. Okay. But then we had a newspaper account on the 31st of July that said five and nine had burned to the ground. You know, so they were both driving. Right <laughs> 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 and, <laughs> oh yeah, we they had that uh, had that problem in the uh, in the AW, area wage survey as well. There's a guy in, in uh, Colorado or California that was what they call curb stoning, which would take you take the old surveys and if, if they're in the survey the year before, you try to keep them in this year, and so he would just make up the data. He just looked at, he looked at the old wage level and say, well, it probably went up about two percent. Just bumped everybody up around two percent, and they didn't they didn't catch it for they wouldn't have caught it unless somebody happened to to contact the business itself for some reason they weren't quite sure about one rate and they, they found out the guy hadn't been there at all and then, he, then they started calling around finally you didn't go to any of these they just kind of bumped the up bumped up the well that way you can save money on hotel bills though. that's that's right he's, yeah he's he's pocketing all that but but he didn't get uh, he didn't get fired i guess he just got moved oh no no he did get fired he, that was yeah they considered that i guess bad enough to to, to let them go. Another thing going on at the time is that this, uh, early 70s was a period where beef prices were rising quite dramatically. And there were a number of meetings that I attended uh, at, at GLS that were sort of brainstorming sessions to, to try to figure out on, on what basis would be justified uh, removing beef from the CPIs because of the distortion of figures up. And uh, the, obviously, whatever's going on in beef is a representative of inflation. It's way too high, you know. So they wanted to throw that out. Like in the 80s, the Reagan administration took purchased single-family housing out of the CPI because it was going up too fast, mm -hmm. and therefore distorting the, the index. Uh, John? Uh, sure. The story about the young lady who had the alcohol and the drug problem or whatever, and how they were sort of constantly telling you, we've got this great drug and alcohol program. And first, I think you've done a, a good job at least thinking, or I'm thinking on the margin, why there's such a so-called drug problem in Washington, right? They subsidize your exit fees for becoming a drug addict. But is it the case that if you get into these programs, it increases the budget of the BLS? Is it drawn out of their budget? So if they have a bunch of people going to drug and alcohol, oh, uh, uh, I mean, that's a pretty mundane question. I don't, I think that's all private. You get, you get to, well, I was talking about the, the one I was talking about is, is a firm that I went to survey with. I'm sorry, I, it wasn't it wasn't the BLS that created it. the BLS. They just let them work in the office. <laughs> you know, the, the 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 employment the employment cost index head trainer was an alcoholic and he had a severe problem and they nobody would do anything about it and they just let him they just let him do his thing. And not the protection of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, I thought that it seemed to me they used to encourage. Uh, people to go to these things. Uh, you know, when people talk about government inefficiencies, a lot of times uh, government officials throw up the Coast Guard as their model of an efficient enterprise. Uh, you know, we have fewer people than the New York, New York Police Department and patrol you know, more coastlines and this or that. And as Max Cosey, uh, it's, it's the same story. The, the wildest ravings of a free market economist don't even touch upon the inefficiencies and the waste and the sheer <laughs> indifference. Of, uh, of that agency, and uh, I also worked for a building contractor who bid on everything turnkey, and if he didn't control his costs, he actually paid out of his pocket for the privilege of doing a certain contract, and if he didn't, if he didn't do it well, he wouldn't get new bids, and that's really all you have to know about public sector economics, right. um, and Mises spells it out perfectly here. He says, you know, if you're going to have bureaucracies, this is what's going to characterize them. There's nothing you're going to be able to do about it. Right. And that's and, the bottom line. And, yeah, and all, and all this talk about reinventing government or making government more efficient is just is just hocus pocus. And he's, he's, he's you know pie in the sky people thinking if we can just if we can just make it a little I mean just be a little bit better at it, we're not going to waste as much money. That's 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 not true. There's just no way to get around it. No calculation. I also I, I want to know why when I call up there I never can't get anybody at the desk <laughs> to t answer my questions about BLS data. I mean I'm you know, some lady I'm supposed to talk to about something, 
And uh, you never get on touch with them. She's always away from the desk at a coffee break or something like that. I'm talking on voicemail, you know. And, uh, and then when you finally do get in touch with her, this data I want, they have, but it's secret, so they can't give it to me. And the data that they do publish is actually a component of these smaller right. secret pieces right. of data. Well, they have all the components, which you can get, but, and so you can add them up yourself, but you can't get this one big secret piece of data. So <laughs> you say, wait, wait, X plus Y equals Z, and Z is what I want, but you can't give me Z. No, you're right. You can't give me Z. Can you give me X and Y? Yeah, I'll give you X and Y. <laughs> Just add them together. I mean, so the place is run by numbskulls. Well, <laughs> in, 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 in their... In their defense about that, there, they, there, there's a lot of uh, they, they have to do a lot, or at least put up a good. They do. I don't want to. Uh, that, that's true. They have to be able to say, look, the data that you give us is absolutely confidential. And so, you know, I'm assuming that they are able to, you know, take the secret data. The secret data is probably the raw data that they're getting. Okay, and and, and they're afraid that. That companies are not going to give them the raw data unless there is, you know, unless it's completely confidential. So they can probably take the raw data and hack it up in, you know, hack it up in two thing, two ways, and say this is what we have because it's not actually the the raw data. We we've done something to it. We've divided it, you know, or something. <laughs> but it, but they, I mean, there probably is. They probably are afraid that they wouldn't get any participation if they started doing something like that. Which I mean, that's they were really concerned. They were really concerned about that. By the way, voicemail, as soon as it was in there, just spread like wildfire throughout the federal government, even though they're not, I mean, the technology questions are a problem, but the fact that they didn't ever have to answer the phone again, was just, I mean, every single agency immediately has adopted voicemail. And now you have, you know, these gigantic menus where you go to the Department of Commerce, and it takes you half an hour, and then they don't answer the phone. And they don't want anybody getting in touch with them. Sure. Yeah. You, have to, no, it's you have, to be, uh, right. have to be very careful with the data. Uh, Richard Alt was... It tells a story about uh, his after-college experience in the Department of Labor, which I thought was part of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. But, um, he worked for the Department of Labor surveying the economic scene in Appalachia. He's from West Virginia. And uh, his job was to go out and survey these people in the mountains of Appalachia about their economic status, about this great big long form. And uh, he and his friend who were doing this surveying job came to realize that the people of Appalachia didn't like uh, people from the federal government coming out and asking them a bunch of questions, and so that it was kind of difficult to actually do a survey, and they'd only get like maybe one or two of them uh, completed before they were, you know, uh, or they'd often be thrown off. And, and so uh, <clears throat> after a while of, of this difficult part of the job uh, of surveying these people and going through these long surveys, they decided it would be much better to just fill out the forms themselves, and, and so what they would do is go to a uh, Burger King or something like that and, and fill out the form based on their previous experience of surveying other people, and uh, and then go out from there. <laughs> so all most of like that, yeah. most of the data, <laughs> most of the data that uh, yeah. was collected there was not. Uh, so I don't want it anyway. Well, I, 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 no, I, I would I, I would say this for BLS data. I mean, there are, there are examples of of curbstone and stuff like this. But if 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 you're going to do a, uh, I, I my opinion is if you're going to do any type of study based on statistics. That the BLS statistics, uh, with all its flaws, is probably better than any other data out there. Just, yeah, just just because the BLS is, you know, a vast vast, uh, I should say, just as much, just a huge amount of resources at the disposal, more than any other, you know, statistical gathering agency. And their their data is like uh, the area wage survey was like reviewed. The data was re re reviewed eight times before it was published. To, to, to make sure that any inconsistency is checked out. Sometimes it's doctored, sometimes it's sometimes stuff anomalies are thrown out. But uh, for the most part, I would say, I mean, if you're going to rely on statistics at all, then the, the BLS statistics are, are probably the best that are out there. But that, but the best that are out there doesn't mean that it's good. It's just the best okay. that's out there. Yeah. Uh, uh, used to be back in, back in the early 70s that uh, unemployment statistics were released in a press conference, the LFS press conference, uh, each month in the statistics. And uh, it was Nixon who, who, who canceled that. It was going into the 72 election, but uh, these numbers started looking bad. Mm -hmm. And so his, his uh, reaction was they canceled the press conference. And uh, I remember William Proxmire at the time was co chairman of the Joint Economic Committee. And uh, immediately, he simply, each month, he just simply had to. Commissioner BLS appeared before that 
hearing, you know, where they would ask for unemployment. You know, the unemployment statistics, so that's how the numbers were released. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then the members of the committee, you know, very poor understanding of what the BLS bill is all about. We were trying to make the unemployment. And so the, the commission would go up there and announce the statistics, and one of the members of the committee would say, well, uh, do you think you can do better next month? <laughs> <laughs>